In today's magazine, we look at how international monetary investments are supporting Jamaica's economic growth. And later, what can happen for you through flexi-work arrangements. Welcome, this is Jamaica Magazine and I'm your host, Audrey Williams. We turn to the news right after this break. The JIS Heritage Poster Competition is here again. If you are an artistic teenager, the JIS Heritage Poster Competition is just for you. All registered secondary school students are eligible to enter. All you have to do is this. Complete the entry form on the JIS website, jis.gov.jm. Then, create a poster using images provided in the picture resources on the JIS website. And the topic? A moment in the life of a Jamaican national hero. Ensure that your poster is no larger than 11 inches by 17 inches and keep a copy of your poster. Posters will be judged on interpretation of the topic, originality, and presentation. Now for the submission details. Upload computer-designed posters using a cloud storage service such as Dropbox, SkyDrive, or Google Drive. Mail or drop off illustrated posters at the JIS head office or Montego Bay office. Deadline for submission is Saturday, October 31, 2015. So come on, unleash your creativity and win lots of prizes. For more information, contact the Jamaica Information Service at 926-374026, extension 2137-2023, or email heritageposter at jis.gov.jm. Good day, I'm Stacey Ann Smith, and this is your JIS News for Wednesday, October 28. The World Bank has named Jamaica one of the most improved economies in which to do business globally in the newly released Doing Business Report 2016. The report, which looks at countries' performance in 11 areas of business regulation, has ranked Jamaica 64 out of 189 countries in which to do business. This is the highest rank achieved by any Caribbean country. In the Latin American region, Jamaica was recognized for implementing the most reforms for the second straight year, placing the island sixth in the region. Industry Minister Anthony Hilton has welcomed the news, saying the report is a reflection of the tremendous work being undertaken across government to facilitate the growth of businesses and the attraction of new investments, both locally and overseas. A special unit is being set up in the Ministry of Health to monitor both private and public sector facilities for newborn babies. This is in keeping with the United Nations Every Newborn Action Plan, a call to action 2014. The health minister told Parliament that the unit would be headed by neonatologist Dr. Michelle Ann Richards Dawson and include doctors Jacqueline Bisesa Mackenzie and Simone Spence, with support from the ministry's epidemiologist Dr. Karen Webster and the chief nursing officer. The establishment of the unit is in response to the outbreak of the Klebsiella and Serratia infections, which have caused the deaths of 19 newborn babies at the Cornwall Regional Hospital and the University Hospital of the West Indies. Dr. Ferguson said investigations indicate that the extent of the outbreak was caused by a breakdown in the reporting system. As a result, he said two persons had been separated from their positions, while investigations continued to determine any further culpability. He meanwhile expressed condolences to the affected families. We recognize that this is a traumatic experience that the parents and families have undergone as a result of the loss of their loved ones. The hospitals will continue to provide counseling and other psychological support to the affected families Meanwhile, Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller has expressed sadness at the infection outbreak and death of the newborn babies. Mrs. Simpson-Miller was also addressing Parliament yesterday. I want to extend sympathies to members of the family. And I hope that the Ministry of Health will, and the Minister will look at the present system, and to see what needs to be done, that what happened will never ever happen again. 
Justice Minister Senator Mark Golding has released a letter from the UK-based Privy Council, which he says supports the government's push to establish the Caribbean Court of Justice, CCJ, as Jamaica's final court of appeal. The letter, written in 2010, was at the centre of a controversy resulting in the suspension of an opposition senator from the Upper House on Friday. In the correspondence, the Privy Council said the court could consider a visit to Jamaica for sittings, but pointed to the cost Jamaica would have to incur. This included five-star accommodation for all the judges and their staff security arrangements and a venue for the sittings. That letter was in response to an invitation from a UK attorney written on behalf of the then Attorney General Dorothy Lightburn. In a statement Tuesday night, the Justice Minister described the cost to host the Privy Council as considerable and pointed to the cost of the CCJ sittings for the Shanique Myrie case, which were largely covered by that court. Besides the cost, Senator Golding argued that local sittings would not be a priority for the UK law lords, since their priority was to domestic UK appeals. Senator Golding reiterated his call on the opposition to move past the events in the Senate last week and resume the debate on the CCJ bills. The three CCJ bills will establish the regional court as Jamaica's final appellate court, replacing the UK-based Privy Council, which government says will give Jamaicans greater access to their final court. In the meantime, Senate President Floyd Morris says the CCJ debate is likely to continue at the sitting of the Upper House on Friday, October 30. He says the debate's continuation will be considered under advisement in light of Senate opposition members' possible withdrawal from the proceedings. I will do all in my power to facilitate the continuation of this mm -hmm. historic exercise which holds out so much hope for the empowerment of the entire Jamaican society. The Senate President was speaking at a media briefing at Gordon House on Tuesday to address the debate and his suspension of opposition Senator Marlene Malahu Fort for her failure to submit a copy of a letter he had requested. Senator Morris said the suspension would be lifted once the Senator delivered the letter to his office and the clerk of the Houses of Parliament, either by email or in person. And finally, the Agriculture Ministry is looking to a locally developed sorrel harvesting machine to help Jamaica grasp a greater share of the global sorrel market. The machine, which has been developed and patented by St. Elizabeth Farmers and directors of Turner Innovations Limited, Oral and Alison Turner, was formally launched at the Agriculture Ministry on Tuesday. The demand for sorrel on the global market has risen significantly over the past 14 years, but Agriculture Minister Derek Kellyer says the high labor costs for harvesting the produce had hampered previous efforts to increase production. The new machine is expected to cut the duration for deseeding sorrel by at least 50%, reducing manpower needs from 10 to 1 laborer per session. For too long, farmers who have to try and survive and eke out a living have found it very difficult to really make money out of what they do because of the methods that they have had to employ in the past. And this is really a brilliant idea that has come to fruition to introduce this machine here today that will help um, the farmers to reduce costs and indeed increase their take. The Turners were given a grant from the Development Bank of Jamaica to improve their 2013 patent for the harvester. The machine will be undergoing field testing among local sorrel farmers to determine its efficiency. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stacey Ann Smith. Thanks for watching. Guns are a significant problem in Jamaica and that is why we have to move to do something about it. It is in this context that I am now launching a special initiative of the Jamaica Constabulary Force, the Get the Guns campaign. You, the public, can keep illegal guns out of your communities by using all means to inform the police as to how illegal guns are stored and moved within the communities. Download and use the Stay Alert app from the Google Play Store. Call 119-311-811 or the nearest police station. In strategic priority number one, fiscal prudence and pursuit of a credible macroeconomic program, we see how the government is practicing good money management by using financial investments to service debt obligations.
Being financially responsible while carrying out a program to improve Jamaica's economy continues to be one of the hallmarks of government. In June of this year, the government had a non-deal roadshow in the United States and Europe to tell stakeholders about Jamaica's progress under the economic reform program and boost investor confidence. That objective was achieved. On July 23, the government raised $2 billion US dollars through a bond offer, the highest ever in a single transaction. This strong interest by the international capital markets demonstrates investors' confidence in Jamaica and specifically in the economic reform program and the various initiatives this administration has already implemented and which it plans to implement in the future. It's not that we are borrowing more money and digging our deeper hole for ourselves. We really borrowed those funds in order to pay off a much larger debt. So what's the purpose of the two billion US dollars? Well, 500 million will be used to make government bond payments of 62 billion Jamaican dollars. That's due in February 2016. That payout will give banks more money to lend to individuals and will drive a reduction in interest rates. The remaining 1.5 billion of the 2 billion US dollars raised on the international capital markets was used to fund the Petrocarib debt buyback. Let's break down the issue. Under the Petrocarib agreement, Jamaica pays Venezuela up front for a portion of the oil it receives from the country. If the oil price exceeds 40 US dollars per barrel, Jamaica should pay Venezuela the remainder of the money 25 years after at an interest rate of 1% per year. Now, Jamaica and Venezuela formally entered into the Petrocarib Agreement in 2005. That means Jamaica would not need to pay for a portion of the oil it received in 2005 until 2030. But things happen, and each country has to adjust its economic plans to suit its current needs. So Venezuela said, Jamaica, if you buy back or pay off your debt under the Petrocarib Agreement before the deadline in 2030, you will receive a discount. So we can take approximately one and a half, um, one and a half billion US and buy back approximately three billion US of debt from Petrocarib from uh, Venezuela. So you're really, in a way, buying back the debt pretty cheaply. And so the government took up Venezuela's offer, using the $1.5 billion we spoke about earlier to clear arrears as at December 2014. These transactions, which were successfully completed, are for and will be to the benefit of the Jamaican people. Here's why. Point number one. Our debt service will be lower by just under 300 million US dollars over the life of the transaction. Point two. These transactions together allow for a reduction in the nominal debt stock. This is contrary to the notion that has been posited in some circles that the government is increasing the country's debt. Point three relates to the ratio of Jamaica's debt to gross domestic product GDP. This transaction has the effect of lowering the debt-to-GDP ratio by approximately 10%. And it is going to allow us to achieve the March 2017 debt-to-GDP target of 127% 20 months early. So this is a major accomplishment and a major benefit uh, to the country from the Petrocarib deal. And point four. The reduction in the debt to GDP ratio and the improvement in the country's risk profile means better interest rates, not just for Jamaica, but for all investors wanting to invest in Jamaica. In addition, the Petrocarib Development Fund, which was saving money and investing in projects to pay Venezuela when the oil debt payments were originally due in 2030, will now be required to pay Jamaica's central government. The payments from the Petrocarib Development Fund will allow further the government to improve the services that the government provides. 
a number of stakeholders have commended the government for the Petrocarib debt buyback. I think that the Petrocarib transaction puts Jamaica very firmly on the path to achieve the 2020 target of 96% debt to GDP. And this is a important uh, milestone in the general uh, um, economic reform program that we have undertaken. And on the international scene, international rating agencies like Standard & Poor, Fitch, Moody's, they will take another look at Jamaica uh, and we may see that they give us a rating upgrade. The International Monetary Fund also supported the Petrocarib debt buyback. We welcome the recent Petrocarib liability management operation. It was a proactive and important step in reducing Jamaica's public debt. The Government of Jamaica, acting on strategic priority number one, being financially responsible while pursuing policies to improve the economy. As a premier tourist and business destination, we need to ensure that Fui Backyard is always pollution free. Having a clean and healthy environment can assist in driving a productive business environment. We all need to take responsibility therefore for keeping our little corner clean and ensure we not dirty up Jamaica. Keep we island clean, so clean, from the peaks to the beach, so clean, not dirty up Jamaica, please don't do it. Keep we island clean, so clean, from the peaks to the beach, so clean, not a tea of Jamaica. Jamaican people, really? You know, we can do better. The beaches, Jamaica is known for its beautiful beaches, and if we continue to litter it and stuff like that, then nobody will want to come here. When we have blockage of drains and all that, we, we blame the government, and yet we are the ones who facilitate that. The amount of garbage littered on Jamaica's streets is astounding, if not embarrassing. The government is paying out millions of dollars annually just to get rid of garbage. The tourism ministry alone is spending more than $560 million this fiscal year on cleanup programs. Through the Tourism Enhancement Fund, $60 million is being provided to the Jamaica Environment Trust to implement a clean coast project. Meanwhile, an agreement valued at $260 million was recently signed with the National Solid Waste Management Authority to execute an all-island maintenance beautification project. We have a $140 million program to do the North Coast Highway and over another $100 million that we are using for the cleanup of the best of the island. Money that could be spent on other critical areas such as education and health. It does not negate the responsibility that each and every Jamaican has to clean the environment. It's a way of living. It's something that has to be inculcated in your home when you're growing up. It's a paper, it's a paper, lying on the floor, lying on the floor. Make the place untidy, make the place untidy, pick them up. That's why it's always good to see a lot of children here, because it's really important for them as well as us adults, that we can lead by example and actually show them that we care about our environment and it's important to keep our environment clean as well. Recently, during International Coastal Cleanup Day 2015, it was made evident that Jamaicans are not properly disposing of their garbage. Preliminary estimates show that thousands of pounds of garbage were collected off the nation's coastline during that one-day cleanup exercise. Well, the first objective really is to get people to understand that when you throw waste at the side of the road in Kingston or in a gully, that this is where it ends up. It ends up on the coastline, it ends up in rivers, it ends up in the sea, where it is often washed back onto the land by storms and so forth. What is a bit disconcerting for me is the fact that every year we come and having cleaned up so much garbage, picked up so much garbage in one prescribed area, you come back and find actually more garbage. In September each year, the Jamaica Environment Trust organizes the beach cleanup, which is regarded as an environmental education and advocacy activity. Clean up, clean up, clean up, clean up. Every day I make clean. I 
Documentation is made of the type of debris collected, and this data is used to help formulate future cleanup campaigns. The fact that people are just throwing and littering in the community, in, in, in this area, but the fact that in the communities around Jamaica, that litter is being thrown into the gullies and the drains. It's washing down, in this case, washing down like the Hope River and then washing up on our beaches. Today we went straight down this whole stretch um, with, I think, 20, about 20 girls and we found buckets, bottles, condoms, syringes, hair rollers, um, mostly, the most, the, the most abundant thing that we found was um, the plastic bottle cap. We have glass bottle, tire, fridge, TV, and other little dead debris like dead fish and so on on this side. This is totally unacceptable. We have a lot that we have to do. Um, there's a responsibility of government um, as much as possible to provide the receptacles to put the garbage in, to do the, the campaign. But there's also the element that each and every Jamaican has to sort of learn the social mores to ensure that we're going to keep the country in a, a way that we're protecting it for future generations. Longing for flexible work hours? Well, the Ministry of Labour and Social Security is ready to give you just that through its new flexi-time arrangement. This means both you and your employer can arrange the traditional 40-hour work week in a way that best suits your needs and that of the organisation to which you are employed. So expect a shorter work week, more family or business time, more jobs through part-time work opportunities, reduced traffic during peak hours, improved customer service due to varied opening hours, reduced absenteeism, and much more. So come on, balance work, balance life with flexi time. One major advantage of the flexi work arrangement is the fact that one will see an increase in employment opportunities. In our next feature, we share with you how you can benefit from this type of arrangement. On March 25, 2014, the Employment Flexible Work Arrangements Miscellaneous Provisions Act was tabled in Parliament. It sets out to amend provisions relating to hours and days of work in several pieces of legislation to facilitate the implementation of flexible working arrangements in Jamaica. The end goal? To position the country's labour market to take advantage of investments and other economic opportunities. FlexiWork is an alternate arrangement or schedule from the traditional Monday to Friday 9 to 5 working day or week. In principle, it allows individual employees and employers more room to choose when they start and end the workday or even which day of the week to work. So it could be that a person could be starting at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, or it could be that the hours you work could be 8, it could be 10, it could be 12. Days of the week would no longer have to be just Monday to Friday, you could choose. But does this mean that everyone will be on a flexi-work system once the law is changed? Flexible work arrangement is not for everybody and we must emphasize that. So it's not going to be that every, con every company will implement flexible work arrangements. Every company has to assess whether this will work in my particular organization having regard to what I actually do as a business. Since flexi-work will not suit every organization, you might ask, what if I want to work flexible days and hours and the company I work for is not implementing it? Well, flexible work arrangements, it's all about negotiation. The employer cannot force the worker to, Im to implement flexi work and to work flexi hours. The worker cannot force the employer to implement flexi work. It has to be discussion and agreement between the parties. And what of those who would seek to implement it without negotiation? If you choose to vary that contract, the worker can institute proceedings for breach of contract. And the same goes for the employer too, if the worker tries to vary it without the agreement. Because right now, persons are under existing countries of employment, which sets out their terms and their days of rest. When the bill is passed, the Ministry of Labour will be monitoring all complaints, so persons who find themselves in this situation should report the matter to the Ministry's Pay and Conditions of Employment branch, and there is an office in each parish. Over 20 pieces of legislation are to be amended to facilitate the implementation of flexible work arrangements. The amendments will specify that the work week should consist of 40 hours and that overtime is to be computed after the employee has completed 40 hours of work. 
That means for those opting for flexi week, overtime will not begin after an eight hour workday, but only when you have worked beyond your 40 hour work week. The bill will also increase the number of hours in a workday from 8 or 10 hours to a maximum of 12 hours. Reflect that all seven days of the week should be considered as possible working days and make it lawful for women to work at night. Well, the organization would now not be restricted in opening hours. They'd have more freedom to choose the opening hours that would best suit their needs. So they can increase their productivity and also their profits. The individual will be able to more balance work life with family life could choose the work arrangements which would best actually mesh with their family obligations like picking up children. And also they could earn more because it would allow you to choose to work for different people to actually get more money. For the nation, of course, if the businesses are actually producing more, individuals are actually earning more, have employment has increased and it would swell well for the nation. Persons can choose from a range of flexi work options. One option allows for working part time hours and is still earning benefits such as vacation and sick leave. Flexible time allows individuals and businesses to vary the start and end time of each workday. Persons can also telecommute, essentially working from a location other than the office, such as your home. And then there is the compressed work week. This is where you work your 40 hours over a three to four day period. But be careful not to fall below the threshold of 110 days worked to qualify for vacation leave entitlement. A person who works for three days would have only worked for 156 days in the year. So they would still get vacation leave because they have passed the threshold of 110. But under the holidays with pay order, to obtain vacation leave of two weeks, you have to work under the statute for 220 days. So that gets you closer to somebody who works for four days for the week, for example. And since all seven days will be regarded as work days, what will pertain to working on public holidays? The flexi work arrangements bill will not change any provisions we public general Holidays and the payment of overtime to those workers. Persons under minimum wage will still be entitled to double time for working on holidays and persons who work in shops. Other persons who are not minimum wage earners who don't work and who don't work in shops, your contract will still govern how you are paid overtime because that was always the case. We are not about taking away people's rights. We are about trying to ensure that we organize work in such a way that Jamaica can be competitive. And what we need to do is to ensure that we don't delay any further so we can take full advantage of the opportunities being offered to us for growth, development, and prosperity. So there is nothing to prevent any company today from looking at their operations, looking at their markets, and making a determination as to what is the best production fit for their business. In the meantime, the Ministry of Labor and Social Security continues to invite national input with public forums and education campaigns. The JIS Heritage Essay Competition is here again. If you're a primary or preparatory school student aged 9 to 12, you may enter. Write an essay on the topic, A Day in the Life of My Favorite National Hero. Ensure your essay is 400 to 500 words. Include a title page and list of references with JIS being one of the sources. And submit the essay using the application form on the JIS website, jis.gov.jm. Deadline is Saturday, October 31, 2015. So start writing your essay today! For more information, contact the Jamaica Information Service at 926-374026, extension 2137, or 2023, or email heritageessay at jis.gov.jm. And we have come to the end of another episode of Jamaica Magazine. But you should know by now that you can keep in touch with us through our communication channels, our website, YouTube channel, Twitter, and Facebook page. Also, take GIS with you wherever you go when you download the GIS News app for your smartphone. I'm Audrey Williams, and I leave you with a quote from Thomas Huxley. Economy doesn't lie in sparing money, but in spending it wisely. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.